Today, it is still largely cost-free to rape a woman, child, or man in conflict. Sexual violence has been used through the ages precisely because it is such a cheap and devastating weapon. But for the first time in history, we can reverse this reality. It will require leadership and political courage and a relentless determination to match the cold, calculating brutality of those who will rape the innocent for military or political gain. We see the issue of sexual violence as a moral issue of the decade. It destroys communities, not only communities, it destroys individual families and society. And the effect is long lasting. It lingers well after the conflict has ended. It's psychological, it's economic, it's medical. And so the consequences are huge. And I think around the world, all over, it happens from Colombia to Bosnia to Cambodia to, to DRC. It's all over the world. Preventing sexual violence in conflict is our joint responsibility. It must be part of our work in many areas, from peacekeeping and political missions to medi med mediation, ceasefire agreement, security sector reform, justice sector reform, and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. The United Nations system is committed to delivering as one to end the culture of impunity that prevails in relation to uh, sexual violence. The reason the United Nations has taken up the issue of sexual violence is when it realized the impact of conflict on women. And that was what triggered the United Nations Security Council to actually adopt Resolution 1325. The impact is very devastating. Women suffer more proportionally than men, and it's caused an uh, everlasting crisis in the lives of women. In essence, they have actually created a global legal framework that actually ensures that there is a law. It's become a war crime, and now what we're trying to do is try to work with countries to be able to make sure that this issue does not only become a UN issue, it's also an issue that belongs to the member states. So we're working to support individual countries to make sure we end impunity. So not only that leaders are taken to the International Criminal Court, but the legal structures are built in country to be able to prosecute people. Rape and sexual violence are prevalent employed as weapons of war to intimidate the parties to the conflict by destroying identity, dignity and the social fabrics of families and communities. The impact is multiplied by the public humiliation which accompanies these acts when perpetrated in full public view such as at checkpoints. Children are subject to a high risk of violence Reports of torture and death of detained children or of the sexual abuse of both boys and girls are particularly harrowing, to the point where child victims are becoming a defining feature of the Syrian conflict. This year in, our in the Secretary General's reports that was submitted to the Security Council, one of the thematic issues that came out very clearly was the issue of sexual violence against boys and men. We've seen it in Syria. We've seen it in Mali. Men can't go and see gynecologists. And the agencies within the UN, within the United Nations Action Against Sexual Violence, UNICEF, UNFP, they are tailored and modeled to respond to women victims. So we have to look at that issue. And the challenge is huge. Rape as a weapon of war is an assault on security. And a world in which these crimes happen is one in which there is not and never will be peace. Addressing war zone, war zone sexual violence is therefore your responsibility, as well as the duty of governments in countries afflicted by it. In fact, the truth is, in many conflict situations, there is no government to take responsibility. So there is no protection and no accountability. When governments cannot act, the UN Security Council must step in and provide leadership and assistance. For these crimes happen not because they are inherent to war, but because the global climate allows it. 
So the, we're hoping that students can come on board and join us in this campaign to let the world first and foremost understand what this phenomenon is about, to let the world take action, so to be able to bring out those women, victims, boys, girls, men, out of their shadow. There is so much stigma on sexual violence. Communities are destroyed, families are ostracized, children are abandoned, women are disrespected, dehumanized, degraded. And that effect is a battle no one single person can fight. And so we believe with the strong network among students around the world, the connectivity now they have, they will be able to talk to each other and even link up with students in the DRC, link up with students in Somalia to be able to know that these students who have been raped or whose parents have been raped are not alone. My visit is to gain first-hand knowledge, to listen, to hear um, the, the content of what is happening in relation to sexual violence, to be able to know what and where are the gaps, and what can we do to be able to work with the government and the national stakeholders on the ground to address this problem of sexual violence. A woman had been raped in Croatia. She had a son before the rape happened, and she had a son as a result of the rape. And the society started talking about it. And then the eldest son heard about it. He went and met his mother. He said, tell me, is it true that my son was born out of rape? And the mother said, no. And the son said, he's 15 years old. He said, I'm happy it's not true because I will have killed him. Put yourself in that position of that boy. He's so ashamed that his mother was raped. So for every student sitting there, just think about your mother being raped. Just think about your younger sister being raped. Just think about you yourself being raped. How would you respond? How would you feel? This is a personal issue and that's what I said to everybody. These women are our sisters, our mothers, our daughters. So I'm saying to everybody that this is a battle we all have to be on.